this into perspective. Uh, I know that many of you who have been coming to the other energy and clean tech series are what we would in the biofuels industry or derogatory call the electron types. So uh, if it's not collected, connected to a grid, you're not interested. So I wanted to kind of give a little bit of background of, of biofuels industry and, and how it relates to an overall national or international goals to uh, develop renewable energy. So if you look at the uh, Energy Information Administration, the, the Department of Energy's organization, basically uh, from today going forward uh, 25 years, almost 25 years, we're still looking at, at liquid fuels, including petroleum-based fuels and biofuels, being over a third of the, of the country's energy budget. So, you know, all those um, electric cars and Nissan Leafs aside, we're still going to be using a lot of liquid fuels 20 years from now. And that's why there's so much interest in the biofuels industry, because um, in terms of energy density, in terms of infrastructure, we really have a country that's been developed over the last 100 years around the availability of liquid fuels to fuel particularly transportation. And so, and from a definitional standpoint, what are biofuels? Well, basically biofuels are liquid fuels that are substituting for petroleum-based products, and the DOE ca counts them as being part of biomass, which are things that you grow to burn. Um, and some of the other biomass things are wood, which, you know, we civilization used for thousands of years, but basically we ran out of trees, so we don't use it much. Peat, which is applicable in some parts of Europe. Agricultural waste, uh, you know, corn stalks and things like that. So the DOE would count biofuels uh, as part of, of the larger category of biomass things that you grow uh, to create fuel. And, and why are we interested in biofuels today? Well, one of the things that it took me a little bit of time to, to figure out, not having had chemistry since high school, was uh, that although when you burn biofuels, you're putting CO2 in the atmosphere, you're putting new CO2 in the atmosphere. So you're taking CO2 that was in the atmosphere in, in the last year, putting it in a plant, putting it into a tank, burning it, and putting it back in the atmosphere. And that's better than putting CO2 that's been sitting underground for 300 million years into the atmosphere, because the first, if done right, doesn't have a net increase in CO2 and therefore um, helps address concerns about uh, increased greenhouse gases and global warming. Also, uh, for those of you who have uh, as many gray hairs as I do, you remember the, these things called oil crises many years ago. Who knows, maybe we'll have another one again soon uh, if uh, things don't go so well. And there have been a concern in the U.S. government off and on for 40 years about the fact that we import so much of our energy and, th and that our economy depends on energy. And so a number of people and also the Department of Defense have been funding and getting involved in biofuels because of the security issues. Concern about the running out of, of petroleum. Um, if, if petroleum becomes scarce, then, then biofuels will have a cost advantage. And finally, um, whether it be in, in the Midwest, in the Corn Belt, or whether it be in Brazil, or in um, Africa with certain uh, other uh, oil crops, there's an interest in biofuels from an economic development standpoint. Okay. When we, when we think about biofuels, we really have two categories, the ethanol-based ones, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and the uh, biodiesel. So ethanol is blended with, with gasoline, but of course it's not the same as gasoline. Biodiesel is more similar to conventional petroleum diesel. And one of the differences, particularly uh, as represented on this panel, is that although the ethanol itself may be equally suitable as a fuel, there are differences in where it comes from such as, for example, by using sugarcane or by using uh, switchgrass and other cellulose. And similarly with biodiesel, the interest has been less on things like cooking oil and more about things like rapeseed or jojoba or algae for developing biodiesel. And finally, the industry today rises and falls based on the federal mandates, uh, in particular the renewable fuel standards. So the government has said we will have a certain number of gallons every year which will be blended from renewable sources into our existing uh, transportation fuel supply. And um, this actually started under the Bush administration. And uh, we have four categories in which corn ethanol is essentially the least privileged. The, the idea is we want to start phasing out our dependence on corn ethanol. Um, and although these numbers are expressed in terms of gallons and not in terms of percentages, according to the numbers that I, the ca quick calculation I made, basically about 9.3 percent of the gasoline consumed in this country was ethanol. So, you know, uh, 80, 90, 
90.7% uh, gasoline and 99.3% ethanol. And if you look at the RFS2 mandates, uh, we'll be going to two and a half times as much uh, biofuels in another 20 years or so. So with that, let me go ahead and, and turn things over to our moderator, Don Keller. Don is a partner at, um, at Oric, and uh, he'll be talking a little bit about uh, his or what's Oric's interest in the biofuels industry and other clean tech industry. Thank you, Don. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and um, we're going to have a great panel. It's about as good as it gets in terms of uh, panelists in this industry. But first, 30 seconds of commercial. Um, Oric is a thousand-lawyer law firm with 100 lawyers here in Silicon Valley. We are San Francisco origin back to the mid-1800s, actually. Um, and we believe we have the leading clean tech practice uh, in Silicon Valley, which means in the United States, uh, with some of the best companies in various areas. And clean tech's a broad, broad uh, topic, actually. There's uh, fuels and, and solar and software and Fisker, car companies, all sorts of companies. So always open for business. So that's, that's the, um, that's the uh, commercial. Um, let me introduce, uh, we've asked each of the panelists to give a five minute presentation on whatever they would like to present with respect to the industry and their company. And so why don't we start uh, first with John um, Mello. John, you're up first. Uh, John is the CEO of Amaris. Uh, spent 20 years in the global fuels industry, led Amaris through its IPO in 2000, late 2010, uh, held various management positions at BP. Uh, we actually worked on the Total deal uh, with you guys, and that went very successfully, I think. Um, so, John, let me, uh, let me work our magic here and get your slides up. Take it away, John. Can you guys hear me? There you go. Great. I'll, uh, I'll just start by uh, trying to build on uh, Joel's statement about the state of the industry and fuels in the U.S. It's actually an interesting picture. It's changed dramatically since 2008. I remember uh, being a big part of the fuels industry in the U.S. Uh, from about 2003 to 2000 and uh, six into 2006. And during that time, oil prices changed dramatically, industry restructuring, blah, blah, blah. And everybody thought demand isn't going to stop. And at the time, the U.S. was importing about 20% of its gasoline. It's kind of a phenomenal thing. We couldn't consume all the diesel we make in the U.S., so we sent uh, ships full of diesel to Europe and brought the ships back full of gasoline. And that was kind of the trade imbalance that was created. California was in the worst case possible because I always thought California was an amazing place for fuel. Uh, you have really a great strategic position. It's called Mexico, the Rockies, and uh, Canada. As a result, uh, there isn't really enough balance for fuel in California. And then about two months a year, prices in California go through the roof. Refiners make a ton of money. It's a great business to be in if you can cash flow the bad days, right? That's kind of the world of fuel. Uh, in the U.S. Full circle. Let's advance to 2012. Uh, the U.S. is more than balanced gasoline. Uh, it's imbalanced in the country. The Midwest has much more gasoline than it can ever consume. The Northeast is short. California is about balanced. Fuel consumption, gasoline consumption, has dropped 10% in the U.S. since 2008. And you're blending 10% ethanol, or 9.6, or whatever the number is. So again, we're basically balanced, if not a little long, gasoline in the U.S. Isn't it amazing how fast things change? Now, wh why do I highlight that? Because as a company uh, that's been focused on renewable fuels and chemicals, it's not necessarily exciting to be based in the U.S. The U.S. doesn't have uh, the strongest level of commitment, nor is it in a place that really has the greatest short-term strategic issue for fuel. It has a significant strategic issue long-term, 
But as you probably have come to know, the U.S. doesn't really care very much about long-term strategic issues. <laughs> so with that as backdrop and building on uh, Joel's uh, start, let me give you a little bit about Amherst before I turn it over to uh, the next speaker. What, what do we do at Amherst? What are we about? Our, the focus is really on our core. What we're really, really good at is uh, engineering microbes, specifically yeast, to convert sugars into high-value chemicals and fuels. That's our business. That's what we do very well. Our business model is integrated. We start with a feedstock. We have conversion technology. We currently produce in large scale and, and industrial plants for our product, and then we go to in markets. Why are we integrated? Really simple. In my days at BP, it was really uh, interesting to squeeze the capital out of ethanol companies, see the venture capitalists lose all their money, and then make all the money. Uh, in, a, in a period of about 18 months, uh, I ended up making about a billion dollars off ethanol while I saw the industry squeezed. And the realization there was, if you're not actually across the supply chain, if you're either all the way into the middle and you are supplying, buying commodities and supplying commodity markets, the odds are whenever the commodity markets get frustrated with you, they'll teach you a really big lesson. Uh, which is uh, kind of what happened in the early days of the ethanol sector. And I didn't want us to be in that situation. So our focus was always have access to an end market, always have access to the beginning, and then be sure you can convert. Next slide. Uh, our focus as a company has, has evolved from being all things to all people to actually realizing for the foreseeable future, we have a lot of value to create by focusing on high value, lower volume products, and then really helping or working with partners that have very large balance sheets to focus on the commodity high volume products. And you know, just to make the math really simple for you, at Target Economics, this business, for every dollar of capital you invest, can generate anywhere from one to three dollars of cash returns in a single year. In this business, for every dollar of capital you invest, you know, if you're really, really good at it, you might get back 30, 40, 50 cents of capital in that year. So no matter how you slice it, no matter how good you are, that's always going to be a business that's not very capital efficient and is very difficult to win in. But they're very large markets. I remember in the gasoline business, I averaged across the country, I was the second biggest gasoline marketer in the world. Sold more than anybody else in the world other than one other player, and I averaged about a, a penny, 1.25 cents a gallon for profit for all the gallons moved. And that's the second biggest in the world. So again, a very tough business. Let me wrap with uh, one more slide. Uh, the way you should think about our business today is uh, we have a uh, pretty standard approach to making products. It's called fermentation. It's been around for a very, very long time. We put our yeast in the fermentation. Uh, tanks, we ferment our product, we then uh, are able to purify and extract all the product, and are the products we make are in three different classes, C15s, C10, and C5s. Our focus today and where we put a lot of our energy is in the C15. That is a molecule called farnesine, and that molecule called farnesine uh, is derived chemically to many different markets, the fuels market, the lubricants market, polymer and plastic additives, home and personal care flavors and fragrances and cosmetics. For some of those key markets, cosmetics, polymers and plastic additives and flavors and fragrances, we are today partnered with some of the world's leading companies in those fields. We have specific products that are either in market today or being launched into the market and our focus is to continuously grow in those markets and uh, get to the point of being profitable by continuously reducing our costs of manufacturing. And with that, I'm sure I'll take uh, lots of questions from you later. Thank you. Thank you, John. Can you just uh, change here? Okay, let me introduce Jonathan Wolfson. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan is the CEO and co-founder of Solazyme. Uh, and 
uh, is an inventor on many of Solozyme's patents. And before founding Solozyme, Jonathan worked as an entrepreneur with various uh, technology companies and uh, is essentially an entrepreneur for life. Uh, so Jonathan, wh what do you know about Solozyme? Not much. Unfortunately, um, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. This is a, this is a hot ticket to get an invite to. So, so thanks for having me. Um, I actually like standing in this room a lot, and I particularly like looking out the window. And one one of the reasons is uh, because when we uh, we we started Solazim in in, uh, in a garage in Palo Alto in 2003, and uh, it was me and my co-founder and. Uh, a uh, few hundred strains of algae and a black lab, but very shortly after that, we convinced uh, some of what the Valley is very well known for, angel investors, to uh, help us get out of that garage and get into our first lab. And uh, our first lab was a stone's throw from here. It was uh, uh, over in Edison Technology Park, which is basically right behind the supermarket over here. And uh, I put on more than a few pounds at the Quiznos across the street, so um, I know the neighborhood. And uh, we're, uh, we're now up in South San Francisco, but uh, it's, it's really neat coming back here. And I do intend to drive by the old lab before I go home. Um, if, we, uh, if we go ahead to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the company. And um, just at a high level, I think it's important to understand really two things about Solazon. Uh, the, the first is that we make oil. And when I say we make oil, what I mean is we take carbohydrates and uh, sugar cane, corn-based dextrose, and uh, we've demonstrated now a very wide variety of different cellulosic sugars, but we take these carbohydrates and we convert them into triglycerides. And the important points here are a few. The first is we've developed a very efficient conversion technology to go from carbohydrate to triglyceride oil why is that relevant? Well, I think the first thing I would say is that if you look at the arable land on the planet, it's much more efficient on an energy basis, on a BTU basis, however you want to look at it, at producing carbohydrates than it is at producing natural oils. Much, much more efficient. And as a result, you know, close to 90% of the arable land on the planet is actually planted with a crop that is carbohydrate majority. We've demonstrated that many, if not most, of those crops can be very readily converted uh, into oils using our technology. The world needs oils. Triglyceride oils are really, you know, if you, if, you, if you take petroleum and water, which I think nobody would argue, you'd say water is the largest volume liquid on the planet, and petroleum would then be number two. Um, you can argue about the third, and I think a lot of people would say, well, hey, what about liquid natural gas? And I would have to smile and say, yes, that's really the third. But then the fourth would be triglyceride oils. Over a billion barrels of triglyceride oils. What are they? Well, plant oils, animal fats. These are all triglyceride oils. And as a result, what our technology does is it allows us to convert sugars into a wide variety of triglyceride oils. And if we go ahead on to the next slide, I'll explain it a little better. Uh, like John Amaris, like our friends at Cobalt and LS9, we use fermentation. Uh, we use standard large-scale industrial fermentation equipment. And what we use as our biocatalyst is we use microalgae. When people think about microalgae, they very frequently think about something growing in the, in the uh, little crack in the sidewalk down the street or the pool they haven't taken good care of. We actually grow microalgae in the dark. We grow it in standard industrial fermentation equipment, and we do that because it turns out that algae is an incredibly efficient platform to convert carbohydrate into oil. And we've converted a wide variety of carbohydrates into triglycerides in a variety of markets, everything from cosmetics to fuels to chemicals and nutrition, all places that, that uh, triglycerides are used today. And we have commercial businesses running now in, uh, in, in cosmetics, where we have a line that's in every Sephora in the US, and I think most all of them in Europe, and a food business with ingredients that are actually incorporated into products at Whole Foods and GNC. Uh, and we're building uh, our first large-scale fuels and chemicals plant in Brazil. 
Uh, that's the technology. I'm going to talk very briefly, I guess, about the fuel side of the business. It's really the focus. Um, and what I'll say, if you go to the next slide, is I'll really focus on the fact that we use biotechnology to tailor the profiles of the oils. And this is what enables us to enter all those markets. We can adjust chain lengths and saturation. We can add functional groups. And this is particularly important for fuels. If you go to the next slide, what we're able to do in fuels and you'll understand that the fuels markets are competitive. And competing with a barrel of petroleum has gotten easier in some respects. But you know we do see uh, bridges and gaps in between carbohydrates and oil. But as a practical matter, the way we think about the fuels business initially, as the earliest entry point, is as a blend stock. So we use the tailoring ability to make the most valuable cuts of a barrel. And here's an example, soy oil, not allowable in Europe as a biodiesel feedstock. Rapeseed, yes, a couple hundred bucks a metric ton difference. We make a blend stock that you can blend in at 20% and you can significantly uplift the value of your blend stock oil. And uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, very briefly, we've done a tremendous amount of work on the commercialization side. Um, we've been working with the Navy for a number of years now. In fact, I'm happy to say the Navy ran its first operational deployment of advanced biofuels in history about a month ago, and it ran on our fuel. It was a 50% blend in the frigate in the upper left there. Uh, United Airlines ran the first commercial biofuels flight um, in, uh, in US history, and actually the first commercial microbial biofuels flight uh, in the world on our fuel uh, back in uh, October. And uh, Maersk Lines uh, ran a 6,000 uh, mile trip from Northern Europe to India. On, uh, on a portion of our fuel recently. And uh, look, it's a work in progress. And a big part of our mission now is scaling up the technology and entering the most valuable parts of the market, which is why I'm talking about blend stocks initially. I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and let me introduce now our third panelist, uh, Bob Mayer. Uh, the CEO of Cobalt Technologies, uh, who's been in the chemicals and in industrial biotech industry for 30 years, formerly the CEO and chairman of Genencore, has a PhD from MIT, started his career as an assistant professor in chemical engineering at MIT. Some of you might have taken his course. Maybe, I don't know. Um, go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and tell you a little about Cobalt Technologies. We're actually, we're a venture-backed company. We're located in Mountain View, just down the road. And it's interesting, listening to the previous speakers, I mean, we started with yeast, we went to microalgae, so now we have a third uh, fermentation platform. We work with Clostridia. Clostridia likes to produce things like butanol, acetone, and uh, ethanol. So our work has been to, uh, the next slide, to take that platform and drive the, do mutagenesis, drive the selection, the productivity, to the point where the butanol is the main product. We've driven it close to the theoretical uh, limits, and by doing that, and with commercial scale, we would project to be at 40 to 60% under the cost of petroleum-based, or for that matter, propylene-based. So the common way of making butanol today is to crack either natural gas or petroleum to produce propylene and convert that into butanol. And the propylene represents about close to two-thirds of the cost. Our, our model is to take almost any biomass. The only issue for us isn't the type of biomass, but what is the aggregated state? We need a lot of biomass. It's all non-food, so we need to aggregate it. And of course, our initial work is focused where you have most of the biomass aggregated today. It's why Jesse James robbed banks, because the money was there. We we're in Brazil, like our colleagues, working with the sugar mills, because they have a lot of biomass already aggregated. And if you look at the opportunity cost of that biomass, you can get quantities at a cost. 
The other reason we like to work with uh, Clostridia is that it likes to consume hemicellulose. So remember, cellulose is, is composed of three components, the cellulose crystalline portion, the hemicellulose, and the lignin. We have pretreatment to extract the hemicellulose, do it in a way where we integrate with the site maintain the material and energy balances, don't disturb the sugar production. The minute you disturb the sugar production, the opportunity cost goes way up. We can't afford that. So for us, for it to work for us, we have to work in consort with the sugar mill. We need to be in a position where we maintain their balances, work off the opportunity cost so we have a low cost sugar, Today we can do it on the hemicellulose, but the issue is of course it would be even bigger opportunity working on the cellulosic or the cellulose portion of cellulose. But today we're still waiting for that technology to be able to deliver the cost sugars that you need. So we'll focus on that portion that we can work with, and when the other portion comes we'd be more than happy to integrate that and make a more capital uh, efficient factory. So. We can work with virtually any biomass, though our focus right now is largely on the gas from sugar mills. We've got advanced non-GMO clostridia. I have nothing against GMO personally, but in the case of clostridia, it's easier to work with non-GMO and we can get it to the metrics we need. We also bring a, uh, second generation fermentation capability to drive our economics. Like everyone in this business, I mean, butanol is a, a large market, it's $5 billion global market, but we want to drive down the pyramid. So to the, as we deliver the economics, we enter here, and as we drive down our economics and just focus on that, we now have a feedstock that can get us all the way down to the jet fuels end of this marketplace. But this is a tough end to make money. And you don't do that right in the beginning when you're developing something. So we're focused first on the top end, and then we hope to drive further down into that pyramid. So we have a good addressable market, good growth opportunity, uh, and we're in a position where uh, we've uh, developed the relationships, the alliances we need to put in place, the demo plants, the, and ultimately build the first plant, because that's your high-risk plant. And demo plants aren't cheap in this business. You know, you're talking about uh, building something that's one-twentieth, one-tenth of a commercial plant. It's not the kind of thing you fund through venture capital. So you've got to have some way to raise that capital. It could be through an IPO, could be through uh, strategic alliances, could be both. Our focus is on strate strategic alliances, and we've uh, recently announced a relationship with Solve Rodia, the 10th largest chemical company, who's active in the butanol derivatives space and is headquartered in its global solvents division in Brazil. So what drives this as we go forward? If, next slide, please. If you look at the dynamics, and this is looking at the U.S., we know over the last six years, this is about six years' time, we haven't had a robust global economy. And during that time, we've seen about 6% growth in the price of petroleum. We've seen about a 10% annual decline in the price of natural gas. Both of these work in our favor because our, our raw material that we're competing against is propylene. And propylene has been going up throughout the period with lots of fluctuation, but the trend is up. And that's because one, Petroleum is going up, but even more importantly, as the cost of natural gas has come down, you produce less and less propylene because you're basically cracking to produce ethylene as the main product of cracking. And the propylene and higher carbons are a byproduct or a co-product. And to meet the ethylene demand using natural gas, being a lighter feedstock, you get less of the heavier carbons, the C4s, the C3s, the propylene. So as you do that, you have less propylene and you drive up the price of propylene. And that's a virtuous condition for us. 
and one that I think we, we can probably see going on in the next several years. And even then, I think we'll see this kind of trend continuing, maybe to a lesser degree. Trees don't grow to the sky. So this is the backdrop of what we're trying to do, and uh, uh, we feel very confident. We have the economics. We can use the sugars that are available today. Uh, so basically, we're moving forward on that basis. Thank you. Let me introduce Nubar, Nubar Afan, uh, the managing partner and CEO of Flagship Ventures, based in Boston. Uh, so Nubar uh, is the CEO of a venture firm. Uh, we've had three CEOs of operating companies, but Nubar also and his firm has uh, founded and invested in about as many biofuels companies as any venture firm, I'd say. Um, and so has an interesting perspective on this. Newbar has been a senior lecturer at MIT's Sloan School, taught courses in entrepreneurship, innovation, leadership, uh, is on the boards of several biofuels companies, including LS9, Juul, and others, uh, and has a PhD in bio, biochemical engineering from MIT. So go ahead. I'm take the mic. Uh, I think I have the distinction of being the only person that actually Don Keller's firm and Don Keller himself represents in one of our companies. And the last thing I want to do is to have a very expensive lawyer turn my slides. So if that's OK, yeah, out, of, out of sheer cringing watching him do that, I'm going to take over if that's OK. This is, this is the only yeah. time we're together where I'm, yeah, not, here we I'm go. not charging you. Yeah, yeah well, that's, okay. that's what they always say. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm going to just keep my comments, try to go quickly. I'm going to talk about. I'll take a little bit different angle. Uh, it's, it's kind of a little strange. I'm, I'm here uh, in, in an awkward way 30 years after I came to MIT, and I did a PhD on converting cellulose to ethanol using clostridium <laughs> 30 years ago. Uh, and as soon as I finished, when I started, the price of oil was $60. When I finished, the price of oil was 15 And I ran as fast as I could from this field. <laughs> and I spent the next 15 years starting biotech companies. And so much of my point of view that I'll express to you today is from being an entrepreneur in the biotech industry. I've been involved in founding a number of tools companies, diagnostic companies, therapeutic companies, vaccine companies, and have tried to raise money for infinitely long product development processes requiring hundreds of millions of dollars. So the challenge in the biofuel industry is a little less daunting if you come from biotech, it turns out, than if it comes from software. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you my, my views from that point of view of kind of an entrepreneur uh, who reluctantly, in 2003, when presented the first business plan I'd seen in this area, which was the exact same organism I had worked on that Lee Lind had taken from our lab and done his PhD on, and 20 years later came back and started Mascoma, I couldn't resist kind of backing a company that was kind of just out of pure vanity, I think. And, and, and so there I was. Many of you, I'm sure, have, have found ways in your life to go back to what you did early in your life. And in my case, it actually got me back in this field. So um, I think you, you all know that people get attracted to this field when they have this kind of, everybody's looking for the next big idea. And, and I think this, you can read the caption, this could be a discovery of the century. Right? The oil field attracts such people, depending, of course, on how deep this thing goes, right? Uh, so we're, we all in the venture world, in the entrepreneurial world, are kind of always chasing what's not, what's not yet known not to work. Right? And the biofuels industry has many things that are not yet known not to work, and probably some of them will work. And if we could sit here today, I think any of the folks talking today, if we could sit here today and claim that the one thing we're working on is the only thing that's going to work, I don't think that's true. And we all got into this not knowing how long it's going to take, how the world's going to change, etc. So there's a lot of, I don't think anybody's doing this with a short term perspective. What I would just wanted to spend a couple of minutes on here very quickly, so again, I, for, I hope the room is filled with MIT people. MIT people pretty much all have ADD, I've concluded. And that's why many of us are entrepreneurs, because it's the only field in which ADD is selected for. So I'm going to talk about a lot of different things instead of one thing, if you permit me. So we, I thought what I'd do is kind of show you variations on a theme. So this is kind of how carbon dioxide makes itself into a, a fuel, at least in the first generation. And when we got involved in thinking about starting companies in this space, so other than Mascoma, the other three companies were all three started in 
my office and our office is at flagship. LS9, the company that I'll tell you a little bit about next, is named LS9 because it was the ninth life science company we started. Jewel was LS13, and Midori, which, I'll, which nobody will have heard about, is LS18 or something. So it's kind of, for us, we number our companies like MIT numbers buildings, because <laughs> in a weird way, we don't want them to become very kind of full of themselves before they amount to anything. So that's just kind of a bias. But what I thought I'd tell you about is ways to kind of just try to make variations on how you could convert biomass to sugars, or whether, how you could take sugars and make more useful fuels than perhaps ethanol is, or how you might be able to take carbon dioxide directly into a fuel. So that's, that's what I'd like to talk to you about. So three little vignettes, very short. LS9 is a company that started in 2004 to apply synthetic biology to making a more fungible f fuel than ethanol would be, namely a form of diesel. And we literally, with Jay Kiesling, with Chris Somerville, and with George Church, three professors that were not collaborating, basically looked at biochemical pathway charts and said, what's the closest thing to a hydrocarbon that cells make and make efficiently? And we concluded that we ought to work on the fatty acid biosynthesis pathway. And from there, and with the $10 billion of genomics research that preceded us that had given us all these wonderful parts from nature, we started moving enzymes into E. coli figuring E. coli would be the fastest thing to engineer, and it turned out to be the case, to create a, a pathway that could basically make whatever we could make through this fatty acid biosynthesis pathway. Methyl esters is the first thing we've done, which is a form of biodiesel. Uh, fatty alcohol, which is a, a, a $4 billion detergent market. So many of the things you heard before, similar mentality, try to be feedstock agnostic, try to make multiple different products. In the case of LS9, uh, not just by necessity, but by choice. Early on, we did a partnership in the chemical world with Procter & Gamble. They, in turn, taught us how to get into a large chemical market that makes a very similar molecule. And where we are as a company, we're kind of still climbing this infinite ladder, it seems. But where we have reached so far is that over the last year, we've operated in this 50,000 liter scale. Uh, and we've done about eight or nine big runs to show that we can grow these things at large scale. The next scale is 135,000, which is a plant that we've built in, or retrofitted in Florida. And we think commercial will be kind of roughly 10x from where we are today. So we're getting to the point where at least a commercially viable product, for us it'll be a fatty alcohol, will be, we think, beginning to get into the commercial mode in the next couple or three years. One of the other things we've worked heavily on, and it takes a lot, I don't have the time to go into it, but it's ex very exciting engineering of biochemical circuitry, if you will. Uh, the yields we're getting out of this program have gotten to a point where already we're about 65 70% of theoretical yields, and it begins to hint that you could use these pathways to make a commercially competitive product. Uh, if you're going to go into the diesel market, you've got to do it at 100 times the scale that you would in these other markets. So scale alone encourages you to think about niche markets uh, that are in the couple of billion size. That's one story. The totally second, so the way we work is we try to come up with these hypotheses and they become companies and the companies hire people and then they take them the way they go. And depending on how successful they are raising money doing partnerships, they either succeed or fail. So in some regards, I'm telling you the early ideas and then how they grow obviously is a lot of execution. So 99% of the perspiration equivalent in that statement for us is a team the right type of deal structures, et cetera. And maybe we can talk about that in the panel. Very briefly, we also got interested two, three years ago chasing the bottleneck that sugar represents. So you've heard today that we're all, we all have frequent fire miles going down to Brazil. Why? Because there's relatively or has been cheap feedstock there. And so, you know, while we like Brazil, we would like that not to be a debt that we have to pay just to be able to make useful chemicals because everybody knows that your catalytic technology will be held up by whoever has the cheapest sugar. And so we took a quite unusual approach, and there are many other approaches that are being tried. Having spent years in a lab using cellulases to degrade cellulose, that was the particular thing I worked on, what was quite unusual was an approach that we developed counterintuitive, which is to use a solid catalyst to degrade cellulose. And nobody, to our knowledge, had ever tried to do that. It makes absolutely no engineering sense. But it turns out, and I'll spare you the details because I wouldn't tell you anyway, but <laughs> basically, these are solid catalysts. 
just take my word for it that we can make them, and we've made them in a few hundred liters, not a few thousand liters, so there's a long way to go to get to kilotons of this stuff. But when mixed with ligulocellulosic materials, and we've tried, it says in the bottom, every one of these things, lots of bagasse, corn stover, you know, from Malaysia, palm extract, kind of the, the residue, what we get at the end easily phase separates into what is basically lignin, C5, C6 sugars, and a catalyst that we then recover and recycle. And our stage here, which is moving reasonably quickly, is to be at a commercial demo stage next year. We started this a year and a half ago. And we're hopeful that we'll get to an interesting commercial demonstration in 2014. Ironically, in Brazil, because they have a whole lot of bagasse, and we think we can basically, with about a six-month payback, convert that bagasse into about 50% more sugar than a plant already is using. So it's an easy place to make the economic argument. Just to sound, since being filmed, I'll tell you anyway, but to sound totally crazy, our sense is a cheap solid catalyst that's recycled would result in sugar at about three to five cents a pound. That is a third of what people, if they were honest, would say is being done today. And it would be quite enabling, but a long way to go. A lot of mistakes yet to, go, to, to make. So we'll, keep, we'll tell you how that goes. And then the last uh, very quick vignette I'll tell you is yet a different engineering approach to this problem, which is to say, cut out the middleman. So indeed, the planet is filled with all sorts of life forms that are really good at converting carbon dioxide into some form of sugar and storing it. The problem is most of them don't actually want us to use their sugar. They want to store it, and they make it really hard to get at, namely liglocellulosics. Um, what we wanted to try to figure out is, is it possible, and we started this in early 2007, so now this is an old story, could we take all the synthetic biology tools and apply it to a place that had not really been applied before? which is photosynthetic bacteria, cyanobacteria. And when we entered this field, there, were, there was no tool to engineer a photosynthetic bacteria. There were, and all the E. coli and yeast tools were completely unapplicable. And so we spent years and years trying to develop tools, which was, in hindsight, painful but worth it. And what this company, Juul, has set out to do is to effectively com come up with a biochemical catalyst, a cell that can take carbon dioxide and water, which is what photosynthesis does, and instead of converting it into more of itself, to convert it to itself, but also a product that we have engineered in the pathway for. And in this case, we've done this with ethanol, and we've done this with diesel. The diesel in this case is a linear 17-carbon alkene. This is not a biodiesel. And that process, which is easier drawn than, than, than executed, I can assure you, uh, if you really look at the photosynthetic efficiency of cells and what you could reasonably push these to, and we've published this, so all of our assumptions are pretty public at this point, we believe that a reasonable, achievable land productivity for such a system, direct conversion of carbon dioxide into a liquid fuel that's secreted, is about 15,000 gallons per acre per year. Now you might say, what does that mean? Well, if you compare that to the best, fastest growing algae without doing the type of genetic engineering we're talking about, you're gonna get in nature, on a good day, that's 3,000. Cellulosic ethanol is 2,000. And so basically, this goes after the problem of saying, how do you make a lot of this material without using all of the US to do it? So th to minimize the land. And where we are with this, let me actually skip, skip, skip ahead, is we've been at this on the lab. We've now had about a year and a half of pilot uh, uh, scale experience in Leander, Texas, and we're now building in New Mexico a five-acre demonstration facility. If that operates in a linearly scalable way, which we yet to see, probably end of this year we'll begin to see, our projection is that you should be able to, if all this works out, you should be able to produce diesel at an equivalent barrel of oil price of about $50 a barrel with no subsidy, with no price for carbon. And that's not, you know, this is not kind of making claims. I can show you every detail of calculation. To do that, we'd need that land productivity and we'd need capital costs that can only be obtained by using plastic and extremely efficient kind of processing so that you're not spending a lot of money building very expensive plants only to get a cheap product. So I'll stop there. I gave you three stories, but there it is. And we can maybe discuss anything you'd like. Thank you.
Thank you, Newbar. Why don't I ask the panelists to come up and uh, grab a chair. And uh, this is the opportunity for us to ask these guys questions. Uh, I've got a list of questions, and I've also got uh, a bunch that were uh, raised on the website as people registered, and, and I'd love to have other questions from the audience as we go through. Um, so let's make this as interactive as we can. Why don't we start with a couple of questions that were um, part of the presentation materials. And the first one is, um, how realistic is it that biofuels will in fact compete with other transportation fuels? In other words, I guess another way of saying that is, have we mislabeled this panel as biofuels? Should it, should it be labeled chemicals in, instead? I mean, at the end of the day, fuels is just another biochemical, it's just a very big one and a very uh, low cost one, which has a lot of subsidies. I mean, you can't eat, you know, if you calculated all the subsidies and what it costs to keep peace in the Middle East and the armed forces to support it, that's not in the price today. But it's part of the cost. I mean, that's a fact. But that's the way it is. That's probably not going to change. So we're going to have to just be efficient as heck and be able to do it. Is it going to happen overnight? No. It, I mean, the oil industry took over a century to build a huge amount of capital investment. But I think if you look at all the ideas that are here, not all of them will succeed. Some will, maybe in different angles, different niches. But with the kind of metrics we're talking about, you can generate a rapid expansion of this industry. But it won't happen overnight, and we'll have to deliver. John? Complicated question. Uh, let's go back in uh, history for a little bit. Uh, it took Rockefeller 30 years for uh, oil to be competitive and to actually be used for transportation fuel. Until he got there, he used kerosene as a high-value market to actually develop the industry uh, and then kind of reverse integrated once he had enough accumulated, uh, accumulated cash to be able to do that. So I don't see the industry being created now as any different. I hope it doesn't take 30. I think we can probably get there in half the time, uh, but it's, it's not overnight. And so other markets and other opportunities, I think, are uh, really important. The other consideration is, you know, it's not like we're out of oil. It's just that it's become much more expensive to extract it, uh, and uh, it's uh, a lot riskier. So I think the price is, has changed and will continue to change. So it's a moving target. It's not, you know, is it a $50 a barrel oil that you really care about? No, it's probably more like 70 to 100. And then what will it be like 20 years from now? I really don't know. But it's definitely not going to be, you know, 50. So it's a moving target. And I think other opportunities give you a great way to fund our way there. And if it takes half of what it took Rockefeller, it'll still be a pretty amazing business. Now, since you guys formed, or, or, or the four companies, or many companies that you guys are involved in, uh, were formed, the North American energy market has changed dramatically, right? Oil's been discovered everywhere, and fracking, and natural gas, and natural gas price. Has that, I mean, that has to have changed your outlook. And the, well, uh, it changes the outlook more in conversations like this than it does in the long run for commercialization. If you really look at, uh, at the markets, it, all, all the fracking for oil that you can possibly do isn't going to change the price of a barrel of oil. And it's also not going to change the reality that oil is a fossil fuel, natural gas uh, is a fossil fuel, coal is a fossil fuel, and they will run out, they will get more scarce, and biofuel just take ethanol itself, um, but just between the U.S. And, and Brazil, and we can have long policy arguments about what makes sense and what doesn't, but you're, you're, you know, you're, you're around 20 billion gallons. I mean, biofuel exists, uh, and it exists at scale. Um, I think that um, there's going to be a variety of technologies that are going to be successful. It's going to take time, and if you looked at the people who are up here on the panel and you listen, you'll see everybody's looking at the right ways to build a business strategy. And the first thing you have to do when you build a business strategy is make sure that you're around. 
And, uh, and, and the point there is really simple. You know, you'll hear people talking about fuels, and I, I was very upfront that the way we expect our first commercial foray into fuels will be blend stocks. It won't be competing directly against a barrel of oil. And over time, as you, get, as, as you build bigger plants and, and you create better relationships, and, you know, your price will continue to come down. But uh, we can't afford for biofuels not to work. Biofuels have been around for a very long time, and they're going to provide a much more meaningful mix uh, moving forward. Um, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about scaling up. I think most of the companies that we've talked about and that you guys are involved in have gone through some of the initial technology phases and are involved in scaling. What, what are the challenges involved in scaling, both technically and financially, that you guys are facing, and how are you addressing those? ample experience and nightmares we could share. Uh, what's, what's not hard about scaling up would be a very short discussion uh, when you're dealing with biotechnology. Uh, so I think, I think that um, if you're dealing with microbial fermentations, uh, there really is no guarantee that what you're doing at five liters is going to be the same, and you really just have to do it. And the big problem is that the capital required to demonstrate at scale wants you to have demonstrated at scale before it's available and you need their money to be able to show it at scale, and this is not magic. I mean, that's why the government's trying to do all these subsidies and this and that. And the problem, of course, is you can't do subsidies on every single technology, although they'd like to believe that. And so what happens is when you have free money in the form of loan guarantees and handouts, then that's, a, that's an invitation for every single idea to come forward as though it could be the one that should be scaled, and you very quickly run out of money. So there's no mechanism for that. So that's one answer I would give you. The other answer I would give, and this is the thing that really motivated us to think about a direct conversion of CO2 into fuel, was in fact scale up. Because it turns out that in a solar technology, like many people in the room I'm sure know quite where how solar panels work, nobody tells you, show me a million liter solar panel. Nobody tells me, you know, I believe you can do it in 10 acres, but I bet you can't do it at 50 acres. Because the 50 acres is exactly 5, 10 acres. And so, and so we chose and we looked for a linearly scalable technology so that we could bring down the cost of proving the economic viability at scale by making that a very small scale. I don't know how you can do that with volumetric scale up. So the good news in the chemical or biochemical industry is you get economies of scale by using big tanks. The bad news is you need a lot of money to show it works. The good news, the bad news of Solar technologies is you don't get economies of scale at the tank level, you get it at the plastic, but you do get the advantage that we believe if you show it at 10 acres, 100 acres will look exactly like 10 acres. Now logistics we could argue, but that, so that, those were the two thoughts I would add on scale up. You mentioned the federal subsidies. Have the subsidies been helpful or, or have, they been, have they hurt the industry? Bringing too many competitors into the market, getting the wrong ones financed, they, they were really helpful for the ethanol sector. <laughs> I think that's sarcastic. <laughs> Just a little. I mean, look, we ended up becoming the largest uh, producer and consumer of ethanol in the world in about a four- to five-year period. So it worked. On the other hand, I'm not sure anybody that invested actually made a lot of money. Uh, and I think that is the issue with uh, a subsidized. I think Nubar said it well, which is when you throw subsidies out, everybody ramps and makes lots of production. When you make lots of production, if you've, if you've been enough, in enough commodity markets, you realize if you invest in lots of capacity, you are going to crash. The only, the only question is when. Uh, and you hope, like heck, you get out early enough so they don't actually hit bottom. And I think that's, that's the cycle. That's exactly what's played out in that sector. And I worry about that in any sector around the world. You throw a lot of money at it, you are going to get production up so the government achieves its objective. But as an investor, it's a pretty tough cycle to play in. And I think uh, Newbar's uh, example of uh, what's it or what is scale about, you know, you actually sent chills down my spine when you asked or mentioned the word scale. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to be on the other side of trying to scale uh, because you actually do wake up to the reality of what it takes. And it's uh, never exactly what you think. And I think the statement is exactly right, cash and time. 
I don't care what you say about it. I mean, I love all the slides because you can immediately tell from the slides who's been through scale up and who hasn't, right? So whenever you see all the slides of exactly what we're producing at and this is just going to take off perfectly well, depending on your process, it doesn't actually work that way. But you do know one thing. You do know that if your system works, when you go to scale is the only time you'll actually make it work and it just takes time. It takes going through the learning curve uh, to get to the right operating cost to actually have a viable organism and a viable system. So you can get their cash in time. And I think that's the biggest takeaway you can give somebody. Make sure you have lots of cash ready. It's going to take a lot longer than you expect. I mean, I've, I've spoken to Cargill re recently. They've scaled seven organisms into seven different product markets. And they'll be the first to tell you two of them were significantly different than they expected. And they were very good at it. I mean, these were after significant experiences. Two were very different. One took two years to sort. The other took five years. The other five actually all worked very well, which meant it took six months to a year to actually get to anywhere near the production targets they expected. And again, all that means is lots of cash. You got to be patient. Uh, and if you've got a half-decent organism, it'll work. But you got to stick with it. And, and those are technical issues, science issues that, that, that cause the stumbling blocks? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's a, it's a combination. I would look at this, um, I, I certainly agree with everything that's been said, but I, I would also look at this a little bit more positively. Because we, we've been... We, we've been because he still has his cash. <laughs> but I've been through that scale-up mountain, John. Oh, have I? I'll tell you that. And, uh, and, and w what, what I would say is, you know, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to create the motivation. We... we many years ago had a team of a, a very small team who said we're not ready to do this we can't do it yet we're not ready we 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 we, we haven't worked enough of the bugs out to start producing material and i went out and sold oil before they had made any and guess what they figured out a way to do it and uh and, and not only did they figure out a way to do it they figured out a way to produce significantly more than we needed to deliver and, and I would also say that, you know, if you're in, involved in the, in the scale-up of industrial fermentation, while there are certainly downsides to it, the beautiful thing is that equip, there's a lot of equipment out there in this country for industrial fermentation. You don't have to sink all your own steel in the ground to get started. We've worked with multiple CMOs, and, 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 and I won't sit here and tell you that transferring a process to a contract manufacturer and having them help you scale it up is easy. In fact, I'd tell you it's incredibly painful, and you have lots and lots of motel nights and lots of exhausted engineers. But the truth is, they're out there, and you can leverage that. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, everyone's going to look at it and is going to figure out how to be creative. We, we ended up leveraging uh, agreements with the Navy to run, you know, well over 100 runs at 75,000 liters. And that, that, for us, was a really important way to get that really brutal learning experience. But, uh, but, but there are real opportunities out there. It's not, you know, it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's something that's been done quite a few times. And you just have to have intestinal fortitude and, yes, time and money better already <laughs> and, and clearly you have to figure out how you're going to pass through the the keyhole it's not a comfortable thing to get to the other side it's difficult you have to plan out how you're going to do it where the funding's going to come and you have to start early i think it's a big mistake to get into this without having thought through how you come through that scale up the demo and developing the relationships because somebody has to bring the money. They have other uses for their money today. And some of them can pay off faster. So you've got to find ways and partners who see that it's in their direct and best interest. The best thing you can trust in is somebody's self-interest. So you have to satisfy your partner's self-interest to get to the other side. So it sounds like the best way to finance the scale up is through partners. Is that fair? Whatever the cheapest source of capital is. We have uh, about 600 million in, about half of it non equity, about the other, the other half uh, equity. And the half that's non equity is uh, driven by partnerships, collaborators, uh, most of it uh, through a very large partnership with Doltal, the French oil company. So I, I don't, it's not one or the other is where the money is. And I think the, my, my most recent observation is. Uh, the money for our sector isn't here in the U.S. 
is I think one of the biggest opportunities is, you know, can that change? I don't know. But I can tell you that the money for our sector today is, uh, is overseas. There's a lot of it in China. There's a lot of it in the Middle East. And there's a lot of it in Europe and, and Brazil. I think Brazil has been a great funding source uh, for us and I think our, our uh, colleagues here. So I, I, uh, I'm not uh, prejudiced about where I take it as long as it's uh, aligned interests. Uh, they're motivated and they want to do a good job and we want to provide a great return for them and they're patient enough to get through the uh, get through the scale of pains when you take foreign money like that does that mean you your facilities might be pushed offshore into those countries or, or have you avoided that uh, we've avoided that uh, but it varies I mean uh, we, we've had a significant interest from some Russian investors and for them, there is a critical criteria to, uh, to actually invest back in the country and build assets in the country. Uh, some of the Middle East money wants, uh, uh, wants a lot of educational focus in the Middle East. So taking the technology and developing or developing more scientific capability in those countries. Uh, the Brazilian money today is very focused on IP in Brazil because they're very focused on innovation as a key enabler for future growth in the country. So everyone has a bit of a motive they're trying to achieve, and it always works well when you get those aligned. It doesn't, doesn't always come out that way, but that's really the focus. So if you were trying to raise more money for your next product, w would the primary source of capital, do you think, be from foreign sources, as you said? Is, is, would that be the, the top of the list, the top 10? Uh, folks on the target list? I, I would I would create a little pyramid in the ground on some beach and I'd ask Nubar to come over and look at it. <laughs> so I you know I I'll I'll uh I use that as a as as a jumping point to say I you know having watched the biotech industry thirty years ago, the the, the weird part is in this industry the role the role of the large companies. So I think total notwithstanding, you know, as and I'm not I'm not running one of these companies, so I spent 20 quarters being CEO of a public company, and I made a deal with myself and my wife never to do that again. So I have great sympathy for, for my panel uh, colleagues here. Uh, you know, what I've observed is that the oil companies got into this renewable fuel thing partly because they thought they could run nice ads, partly because they had R&D people who kind of said, you know, we can do this too. And there was, in my view, kind of a high-level curiosity at a strategic level, but I wouldn't say that any of them actually in board meetings were either threatened or viewing this as a big opportunity to make money, because they were making a lot of money anyway, in, in my humble opinion. The chemical industry, actually, 30 years ago, went through this dance once, because if you go back, and the oil industry, awkwardly enough, I don't know how many of you know in the room, but there's some people that are my age or older, you may remember, Genentech had oil and chemical companies as investors. Biogen had oil and chemical companies as investors. Integrated Genetics had oil and chemical companies as investors. Every one of them. And if you look at the initial business plans that I've seen at Genentech and Biogen, one of their programs in each, two comp in each of the companies was either a fuel or a specialty chemical. That's how this industry got started. And, but the weird part is that the chemical industry has somehow convinced itself that their margins are pretty low. And therefore, they ought not to think of this in a long-term strategic way. If you can't make it one cent cheaper, or you can't give them price guarantees, or if you don't de-risk it, they're not going to jump in and put up a lot of money. Well, if that's the case, then in fact, we're going to go wherever the money is. But I, I think what I am a little optimistic about and is that you know, six years later, some of these larger companies are beginning to realize that this is a reasonable place to innovate, Collaborating with startup companies is a better way to do it than pretending that they can have thousands of the best scientists in the world working for them instead of startup companies out here. And therefore, this notion of open innovation and them thinking, you know what, what do we have? A brand, plants, money, and the ability to scale up and produce. What do they have? Inventors, you know, people who don't know any better, uh, people who like working day and night as opposed to go home at 5 o'clock. How do we benefit from that? Well, this is, you know, and, and the moment when that clicks in a CEO's brain, not in the head of purchasing who wants to buy slightly cheaper XYZ, then I think all this will happen. And that's where I would look to raise money. I would actually spend some time, I think whoever is the industry association, and I don't know them because I don't go to any of these meetings, but whoever it is should say, how do we get the CEOs of the top 20 companies 
to just associate with these folks long enough to get it. Cut out the, all the middle informants they have who are just filtering every good idea so that it doesn't get to the top. That's what I would do. I don't, and this was done in biotech, and I can assure you that the pharmacist, but for the initial pharmaceutical company CEOs who bet their reputation on putting up money without knowing what to expect, just because they thought surely there's going to be drugs coming out of this stuff, those people made this industry just as much as the famous entrepreneur CEOs of these companies where their statues made. And that's what I'm looking for in this industry. It may not be possible. It may, not, it may be asking too much. Do you, do you think the, the big players, the chemical players, get it? Do they care enough? Is it, is it a big enough deal for them? It, it's, it's really the point you just raised, Nubar? I think the, you know, an interesting point on this is I would say you're, you are in some respects swimming against the stream until you hit a certain level. The, the, the reality is when, when you enter, I mean, and, and I, had to, I had to really smirk at, at part of uh, those comments because when you hit that purchasing manager level, you're done. Yeah, I mean, it's literally, I mean, the, the discussion's over. And if you end up there, you, you know, you, you might as well go, go across the street and grab lunch. So um, we, we, we have spent an enormous amount of time internally talking about how you get to the people who aren't afraid that making any risk decision is going to destroy their career if it's not perfect. Okay? Because a lot of these companies have grown up in a way where the people who have risen up in, in those ladders never made it quite to the top, but sitting somewhere in that middle range are people who have been able to do it without taking any real risk. And as, as a result, it, it, when, you, when you hit that layer, I mean, it really is, there's, there's a human, I'm going to steal Chevron's tagline here, there's a huge human element to, to getting people to understand the value proposition. And, and, and it's when you get to those people who are willing to sit down, lean back, and decide that these are the, the kinds of measure, measured risks they should be taking as they look forward built to building their businesses that you really make progress. And it, it, it is by no means an easy process. I just want to take one other thing just to pick up on what John said. Sorry for because I'm passionate about this issue. I also think that there is another good silver lining in what's happened in our field, which is hard to say as an investor, but is that basically the, the venture capital community's absolute ignorance about this industry is basically being rooted out. Because what I have been in way too many board meetings where people would say, you know, go do a deal, but you can't give them any license to the technology, and they can't have the first plant, and the economics has to be 90. To, so when in all these things that are clearly not possible in a business that has very small margins, very large volumes, and pretty conservative management. So if you think that as a startup, you are the goose and you can lay gold eggs, sell your gold eggs. If you're going to say, no, 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 the first gold egg, I'm going to hang on to it. I'm not going to give it to anybody. You're not going to get funding from people. So I think that in a kind of a weird way, people are beginning to learn pretty expensive lessons at the board level. And to some extent, I think the CEOs here, and I, I consider myself a founder, but I've done this for a long time. You sit, it's a pretty expensive education. But people have to understand that win-win doesn't mean I win if the product works and I win if the product doesn't work. That's not a win-win deal. These chemical fuel companies actually want, if they're going to give you a lot of money, they got to own the first plant, the first five plants. They got to have rights and geographies. And you got to figure out what is it going to take for them to see it in their interest to do a crazy thing, which is fund the first plant. Some good news. The CEO, this has to be driven at the CEO level or pretty darn close to the executive level. I, I come from the chemical industry. But who gets it? DuPont gets it. They. Genincor was bought by my old company for about a billion enterprise value. It was sold five years later for an enterprise value in excess of three billion. Uh, so, by DuPont. So obviously, this is starting to get through. We're seeing more and more top-level companies, and it's got to be driven at the top because this is a risky area. And let's face it whether it's, you're talking about purchasing or you just talk about the middle level, no one's going to take the risk of pushing something like this. It's got to be driven at the CEO and executive level. But it's starting to happen. Industrial biotech has lagged many of the other biotech industries. 
but the fact that the deals we're seeing made, uh, the IPOs, the, uh, the purchase of MarTech by DSM, these companies, and, and now a, a joint venture between Poet and DSM, companies are getting it. The chemical industry is getting, it's starting to come through that there is something here and they better figure it out. Are there, are there new companies being formed now or, or are you guys the uh, mature players in this industry and you're blocking everybody else out? out? <laughs> I think there's a, a new one every week that I learn about, right? It's a, uh, but I, you know, I, I think I, I expect uh, just seeing how these things develop over time that we're, and I know it's so early to say this, but we're entering a period of extensive consolidation of a lot of these companies. Uh, I, I, I would expect that 24 months from now, there are a lot of companies that either won't exist anymore or will be consolidated. Not because of bad technology, by the way. Uh, a lot of it because it just takes a lot of capital and uh, it's not that it's always being attracted uh, by the right players. New bar, are you guys at your, at your firm sitting around uh, thinking of new uh, chemistries and ideas on how to make new companies in this area, or was that more four or five years ago? Carefully, yeah. I mean, yeah, we're, we're. I mean, some of the reason I went through a couple of examples is because, but for realizing that sugar is a problem, we wouldn't have worked on that problem. But for realizing that if you could just do it without sugar, we. So we're in a way chasing the rate limiting step and chasing the prob the problem. But I would say the other thing that's changing is the business models that people are setting out to do. And this did happen in biotech, by the way. Initially, biotech companies were R&D shops. Then this, the people invented this, this term, FIPCO. I don't know if anybody knows what FIPCO is, right? Fully integrated pharmaceutical company. And every biotech company wanted to be a FIPCO. Then they realized it was a FIBCO because it was not it was a FIB, right? You couldn't become an area. And so maybe Amgen became a FIBCO, and that was it. There were very few that made it. So I think the business models will change out of necessity. Look, if the one thing you've heard from all of us, and I think Jonathan said this well, is the job of the entrepreneur is to basically improvise, stay alive long enough, and chase the value. And we have to realize that to some extent, it's a bit of a Darwinian process. And the people who actually succeed will be given great kudos for their strategy. But in reality, their strategy would have been a highly evolutionary search algorithm looking for how to survive long enough to find the value. And then you get to get up on a panel and tell people how rationally you did it. And it's, it's usually absolutely untrue. Uh, so I actually think, I can't, as we sit here today, gauge the odds. I just think that you need people that are passionate, as these guys are, that are basically kind of realizing that they're going to have to fight a lot of odds and just keep altering, you know. So if it's not chemicals, if it's, it's food. If it's not food, it's just cosmetics. If it's not, and, and that's perfectly healthy. That's not lack of focus. That's survivalism. That's what we're in the business of doing. How about the financial investors? Are we going through a, a little bit of a lull here in their interest level? Is, is that what's happening, or is it? <laughs> I, I, people know a lot more than they did, did before. And we've learned a lot. We've experienced a lot. It is a long distance race. You've got to have the stamina. You've got to be opportunistic. But the financial investor uh, needs to see more good news. Uh, I think all of us benefit the more any one of us delivers. And so to be a part of this group and, and see how each of us is trying to make it a uh, delivery. And the financial investors, they're fine. But right now, they're, they're kind of taking, they're more cautious. The space isn't as sexy back in the beginning when everyone thought you could do everything. Everybody realizes now there are some real hurdles but the fact is, each of us has also learned what those hurdles are and are trying to address it as best we can. I'm going to start taking questions from the audience, but one more for uh, John and Jonathan. You, you guys both are now public companies. Are you happy about that? Some days. Uh, and, I mean, seriously, I think about this, and, and this may be a comment better for a small room than for this one. but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm aware of it. But you know, the reality is, as, as, as you think about, as you think about building really important technologies and, and, and investing your time and energy in it, 
you realize that if you're going to end up in a place that's capital intensive, you need access to capital markets. It, it, you know, honestly, I mean, would I would would our discussion have been different somewhat at Solas? I mean, I was actually quite upfront about this during our IPO process, so I'm being a little I'm kidding around a little bit. But the reality is, if we were if this was a software or internet-based company, I probably wouldn't have gone public at the point I did, uh, because being um, a pre-positive cash flow company in the public markets, particularly in a risk-off environment, you know, it's not the easiest place to be every day. But but as a practical matter. Getting out there, getting access to the public markets, bringing capital in is something that enables you to build a business in a very meaningful area where capital is required to generate a return. So uh, I, my ultimate answer is I'm very happy that we went public. I'm, I'm thrilled that we went public when we went public. <laughs> but but, um, but no, it's an important part of the evolution for capital intensive uh, industries, which is one that we're in. How about you, John? Jonathan said it much better than I could. <laughs> I echo everything he just said. Well, I've got a list of questions from the audience already, but anybody have any questions they want to raise? Go ahead. Can you guys finish it? Well, it's just going to be a question. You touched on regulatory environment when you mentioned subsidies, and I had a question for the panelists in terms of there's a lot of other policies out there. Uh, that are affecting at least the sector that you're in, in terms of biofuels, not as much as maybe some of the biochemicals. There's the Energy Policy Act and the RFS, RFS2. There's LCFS here in California. Oregon's looking at their LCFS. Uh, these are all more than, they're not subsidies as much as they are production mandates. And then you've all got all these other regulations as well in terms of Clean Air Act and California Alternative Fuel Regulations and so forth. Of all these things, which are the most significant, the most harmful, beneficial, if you had the ear of the governor, governor <clears throat> or the president, what would you say? What would you recommend? By the way, I, I should probably ask for a, a show of hands of who thinks RFS or LCFS, RFS2 is going to last more than the next five years. Uh, and if all of you raise your hand, I'd be very concerned, and I wouldn't make investments in your companies. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think they're uh, sustainable or predictable at this point. So the visibility becomes an issue and confidence on investment. So if, if to answer your question directly, uh, government should vote with its money. And I, I have two, two simple requests. One that I made before oil went back over 70, uh, not too long ago, which was put a progressive tax in. I mean, we're getting used to 4 to $5 gas, right? Lock in 4 to $5 gas. It's cheaper than the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world. So why not? Lock it in. Keep it around 4 to 5 and then create a natural incentive and use that money wisely to uh, actually support other issues. You don't have to do anything else with it. Just raise the price and you create a natural incentive for the right products to get the market and make it completely open and competitive. The other is kind of what Jonathan has done a great job taking advantage of, which is the military... Uh, and other government agencies should buy uh, to demonstrate and to lead uh, with their money. So that, that, those are the two simple things. I, I think mandates are very dangerous, uh, and they have not yet proven to be really sustainable. I think if you look at a lot of the government supports in the end of the day, a lot of them are driven by agricultural needs. If you look at Europe, they, they allow rapeseed oil. That's a major crop that's grown in Europe. Uh, so they used to uh, support sugar industry. Now they're really supporting the rape oil industry. Uh, does that, I mean, it's, it's a start. It's creating an industry, but to continue to subsidize does distort things. I agree totally with John on the idea that having a the fact of the matter is oil does cost more than we're charged if you looked at all the costs. So supporting, having oil carry its share of its costs, thereby putting a floor on this, would be beneficial. I don't think we're going to run out of oil, but it is going to get more expensive to get. The social costs are going to go up, like in the Middle East, after the Arab Spring. So these costs are going up. Uh, Beyond that, I would say one of the other things I think that would be useful, we see some countries investing in large 
uh, laboratories, putting in lots of capital equipment, flexible capital equipment, that you just basically have to pay the cost for running it, the people. But the capital's there. So whether you're using a, a CMO or you're using a government uh, supported infrastructure to help do your demos, help do your your uh, scale ups, that would certainly help the industry because that's one of the key hurdles we all face. That's great, thanks, Bob. Another question I have from the audience um, that was submitted earlier was, what happens when sugar uh, is expensive, and maybe uh, at the same time? Um, other fuels are, are not so much. I, I have a simple answer. When sugar gets really expensive, I'm going to be knocking on New Bar's door for this three to five dollar sugar. <laughs> three to five cent a pound. I'm sorry, three to five cent a pound. I, I, I think that's pretty pretty amazing, actually. I you know if if you think about it, if you look at the at the markets and especially the ones that are global, uh, sugar, oil, and then the ones that aren't so global, like local currency. Uh, the correlation and the impact currency moves have is significant. I remember when we first started in Brazil, you know, getting sugar at, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 cents a pound uh, was, was really simple. We thought, you know, economics for fuel, that's, that's a no-brainer. We're, we're going to be competitive in fuel. Uh, $70 oil, we're going to make lots of money. This was really simple, right? All of a sudden, uh, the U.S. decides to shift to a uh, weak dollar policy, China demand starts going up. Uh, Brazilian Hial is very connected to uh, Chinese demand. The Brazilian Hial strengthens, and then what happens? Sugar becomes 25, 30 cents a pound, uh, almost, not quite, but almost overnight. And your economics just fall apart completely. So I, I, the, my whole point is, I'm not too worried about the absolute price. I'm really focused on what's it related to and how do you mitigate risk? just like you would in any, any other commodity. Uh, and I think it's all about that. I mean, as the currency in the U.S. went down, oil prices have continued to go up. Brazil Hiala strengthened. When you balance it all out, I'm not quite sure it changes anything dramatically. So, so far, so good. I also think markets matter um, here. And, you know, uh, the, the technologies people have been talking about up on the, on the, on the platform are, are pretty flexible technologies and if you look at it you know it's really remarkable you know people talk about the 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 carbohydrate risk and and it's certainly a very significant factor but if if you look at the way it's been handled in certain industries look look at the way it works in wet milling and I'm not in corn wet milling and I'm not just talking about the huge corn wet mills I'm talking about the much smaller companies that work in for instance paper starches imagine a small wet mill that work, works in paper starches that basically puts all of the risk of the price of corn on the, comp the paper company buying the paper starch at the beginning of the year and then collects a margin for conversion. Okay? The, we're, not, we're talking about pearl starch here. We're, we're, we're not talking about the, some, some incredibly valuable material. What, what, what I'm saying is that for certain companies that need supplies of materials, there are ways to look at these things. Yes, correlation is a significant, uh, in many cases, it's a significant friend. But, but the reality is there's also an opportunity to do indexing against input costs where you're producing something that's valuable to a particular customer, either for its attributes or for a steady supply. So I, 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 you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but it's not that very simple answer that, uh-oh, you know, sugar goes up you're in trouble. I mean, remember what people are trying to do. It's not a cost of goods sold issue. What we care about is margin. So if the COGS go up and the ASPs go up and the margin is maintained. I think one big issue is if you're going after the very large market, say the fuels market, you're basically if you're using anything that competes with the food, with arable land use, you're going to drive up the cost. If you doubled from 10% to 20% on ethanol, think about what that would do to the cost structure. This is not just fluctuations and hedging issues. This is a matter that it doesn't make long-term sense. So you've got to go to materials that basically 
is biomass. It's something you can't ship around. There'll never be a world market. It's always against the opportunity cost. And is, you've got to stay in that arena if you're going to get into the really large. If you stay at the smaller, high margin businesses, it's not a problem. But the minute you want to get down into that big, big volume, you better figure out how you're going to do it. And again, anybody who can convert to inexpensive sugars is going to have a, a great play. Thank you. Um, another question I've got from the audience uh, is on the environmental side. Um, where do we stand on the environmental debate about whether biofuels are good for the environment or whether, in fact, they create greenhouse gases? I think I know where you guys probably come out on that. And there's different technologies in the room, so I'll, I'll, I'll start out there. But, but for folks who use biomass, it, it, the, the environmental sustainability of, of the fuel is very dependent on the source of biomass that's used. And, and so the answer isn't, oh, I completely disagree that there's the potential to make uh, biofuel that's not positive from a sustainability standpoint. There is. Uh, I, I think that it, in a bid to make sure, you, you know, I think one of the interesting things is it, if you look at the most important technologies that have been developed over the last hundred years, Almost anything you can think of, but just take the internet or take a combustion engine or a nuclear reactor, they can be used for very good purposes or at times they can be used for bad purposes, right? And because there's the potential to use a non-sustainable feedstock, for instance, for a biofuel, is not a good reason to institute policy that can actually kill an industry across the board before it gets started. And if you wonder what I'm alluding to around the side here, um, I'm talking about indirect land use change, which is the, the only place I can think of in, in any energy application anywhere where people attempt to charge a particular type of energy with the indirect carbon footprint for what may be happening elsewhere. Biofuel is the only place this happens. And the, the, the idea there is, is uh, that, you know, something may happen if you use uh, soybean uh, from Brazil that will cause encroachment on the rainforest. And I'm certainly not saying it's not possible. I'm saying that, you know, without, uh, that there are policies now on the environmental side that are really detrimental to the adoption of biofuels, which are very important technologies and wherein the sustainability is driven by feedstock. Um, and uh, maybe I didn't explain that so well. Maybe uh, maybe there's someone else here who can uh, who can fill that in. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question from the audience: uh, Can small-scale facilities be cost-effective? Is that a solution to the capital-intensive uh, nature of the business? Uh, small-scale can be very effective in specialized markets, which actually could be great. I mean, they're not uh, they're not bad because they're small. It can be quite profitable. You just need to ensure that your business scale fits that kind of environment. A good example is you can have a, a whole series of molecules in the flavor and fragrance space and have very small sites that make that product. And you can do all of it through uh, CMOs, through contract manufacturers. So the answer is yes. You don't, you don't need to have a lot of capital to be in the production. You need to have the right product and the right market to sell that product into. And that was Jonathan's point on the margin. It's not necessarily about what cost you have. It's really the margin, which is a combination of the average selling price, what are you selling, and then what cost of production do you have or cost of goods do you have. Are there enough of those niche markets around that have high margins that would cause you never really to migrate to the fuels business? Uh, you know, if, if you can think of uh, markets that can total in the billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, the answer is yes. But again, you have to have the right molecule, the right chemistry, and then you have to have the right access to that market to get there, all which can be done. Um, and it's interesting. In most cases, what's interesting about them is no one of those markets are huge. But the way to think of it is you can have a lot of small technologies, or said differently, you can have a lot of molecules into very small markets. And what, what's small? You, you could very easily be a company that has uh, three molecules uh, every one of them, or it could be a single molecule that's chemically derived to three different molecules. Every single one of them could very quickly be a 30 to 40 million dollar a year revenue that's generating 10, 15, 20 million dollars a year in operating contribution. 
That is not a bad small business. And if you can use that to snack, stack one on top of the other to then get yourself to capitalize larger production for larger markets, that is a great way to step and create a business one step at a time. And can you use this, uh, the same facility for multiple products? Yes. Yes. In, in a lot of cases, uh, what you'll have is, you know, a common molecule, single molecule that gets chemically derived. So within what you need is either to chemically derive it at the same facility or you can send it out. Or in a lot of cases, the partner will help you and actually chemically derive into the final application they need. Yeah, you know, clearly, if you're going to make something like fermentable sugars, you can move into a lot of different areas. But that's going to be a big proposition under any circumstance. So there, you will need large facilities. Next question I had from the audience was: uh, Will the 2022 target of 16 billion gallons be met? 16 billion gallons of what? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the answer from the audience is the concern, right? Uh, if it's 16 billion gallons of renewable fuel, and you're not really, you're not really interested or focused on how you specify the fuel, the answer is, yeah. I don't see any reason why that can't be done. If all of a sudden you say, well, there's a slice in that 16 billion that has to be cellulosic or has to be a certain specific product, I think the risks are much higher. Uh, and the real question becomes, you know, how. There's a, a lot of, a lot of uh, technologies and a few companies that are currently in the pipeline to bring on production capacity of these so-called cellulosic uh, ethanol or cellulosic hydrocarbons. Uh, it isn't clear to me that they're all going to perfectly hit their production targets, which, again, doesn't mean they won't at some point. But it means that because of the difficulties, you don't know how much you're going to make it through and therefore how much fuel you're going to end up really getting into the, into the supply chain from those companies. So I think it is a stretch. It is not a stretch if you just say it's, it's uh, all about renewable fuel volume. It is a stretch if you start to actually categorize what kind of fuel is going to be in that mix. The last written question I've got from the audience is um, what sciences or science or sciences in this industry are, are working best or show the most uh, current potential, if there's there's an obvious answer to that. <laughs> Mine, his, his. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's an important uh, question with a couple of layers. Without getting into pathways, molecules, or frankly, different kind of process technologies, I think, I think what we've learned is uh, as you're developing the technology, if, if you really step back and say, is there a way to industrialize the process of developing the technology? And the tools, the processes, and the methodologies, what I, I find those to be really interesting science. And getting, getting those done well, uh, I mean, I, I think Nubar talked about prior to us coming to life, kind of what happened in biotech and how all those tools were leveraged to actually accelerate development time. I mean, we are seeing that in spades. And it's interesting. Sometimes it's indirect technologies, right? A Google server and what's happened with data management and what's happened with uh, IT infrastructure in the last five to seven years has absolutely transformed our ability to engineer organisms because of the data we can collect and how we can mine that data. So that kind of uh, uh, system approach and the kind of tools, processes, and methodologies that are developed, I think actually are the most interesting science. Because they, and they can be applied, there are tools that can be applied across different platforms. It's not about a tool for an organism, it's a tool that can work with many different organisms. One thing you have to recognize is that execution is incredibly important. It's not just the platform, it's not just getting the money, all that's important. But if you can't execute, I mean, we're talking about products you have to ferment every day. 24-7, high metrics, no bad runs, no infections, no problems. Now, I'm not saying there's no problems, but I'm saying industrial biotechnology is very much about execution. So I think all of us recognize that we've got to be highly focused on execution every single day and be able to deliver that. 
Yeah, just uh, because it's a topic we didn't cover, but I, I think maybe just to, it's not really a science issue, but I would say one of the things that we haven't really run into, some companies are, are involved in this now, is really the whole IP side of this. So in a funny way, since nothing is really working at large scale, people aren't fighting over IP, you know, with, with, a, with a small exception. Um, but when you do, the, one of the things I worry about is how is it that all the people that have put money in to make this happen are going to be able to retain the value that they've created? Because these tools, I mean, I can assure, you can give me any pathway and I can find you another organism with completely different parts and I can recapitulate that pathway. And before you think, you know, I can't do it every single time, but I'll do it many, many more times than I won't. So therefore, you know, at some level, I worry that, especially as you go all around the world, that, you know, what we may be doing is spending the first 10, 15 years figuring this out, and God forbid it works economically, then there will be no way of protecting it. Because you're not getting the stuff out of the ground. We can't kind of say, you know, we'll fight wars and, you know, you can't touch our oil. And how are we going to protect? Nobody, no, no government's going to stand behind these technologies, right? I mean, so it's an interesting, you know, it's not science per se, but I would say, you know, it's, it's funny, in, you know, when we first started out in these areas, the, the closer you get to being economically viable without government subsidies, the, boor, the more you have to realize that your days are numbered. And, <laughs> and it's not at all clear how you're going to protect yourself. Uh, so let me let me make one comment though, because because th this is what you're sitting in. You're sitting in Innovation Central here, and you're sitting in a place where where innovation is celebrated and failure is tolerated, and that's a great thing, by the way. Um, and and I, I guess you know a point that I would make, you know, looking looking because when we started the company, we looked at you know a company that that Bob spent years building, for instance, and we looked at other companies that were involved in industrial biotechnology, and what we found was that over the course of many years, and I think lots and lots of pain along the way, they understood and 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 built a platform to continue innovating, and yes. Is some strain going to end up in a country that doesn't respect IP the way we do down the road? Absolutely, and it probably always will. But if you have the engine, if you have the science, if you have the innovation, you're going to keep developing. And I, and, I, and I think that there's been there's some very successful companies that aren't talked about broadly that are in industrial biotechnology. And it, it's not a case that you build the technology and you're done. You're going to continue to evolve that technology, and you're going to continue to make it better the same way we have in electronics and in many other industries. And uh, and 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 you know, to 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 think that we're going to lose uh, strains and we're going to get challenged on IP. I mean, that's a guarantee. So uh, it's something that when you get into this, you have to have resolved, and you have to you, you hope that your investors have, uh, have a stomach and understand that. But there's certainly plenty of evidence that you can continue to innovate and build technologies, uh, all that said. So Jonathan, that would suggest that your strategy for Solozyme is innovate, in innovate, innovate, and, and don't rely on IP protection ultimately. Well, I wouldn't say that. I'd say we, sp we spend an enormous amount on, 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 on IP. My, my co-founder, after he got his doctorate in genetics, went to law school, became a biotech patent attorney. I tried to talk him out of it many times before. But at any rate, uh, no, it's, it's critically important because it will protect you in, in, in certain markets. I mean, another company that Bob mentioned was, was MarTech, uh, who's, who's managed to hang on to its market for many, many years uh, in, in a lot of places in the world on the strength of its intellectual property. Intellectual property does matter. It doesn't mean there aren't ways around it, but remember, you're, you're not just talking about the pathways, you're also talking about the applications, you're talking about the formulations and lots of different things, and, uh, and ultimately intellectual property is a, is a critical tool, but it can't, it's not the only one. Innovation is going to continue to be critical on top of intellectual property. got a couple questions for you guys. Uh, well, the first one is for uh, Nubar. And you mentioned a solid catalyst. I was wondering if you could tell us anything about that. <laughs> OK. Uh, my next question, because I knew that you were probably going to say that. At least I thought you were solid. <laughs> right? I mean, before I told you, you wouldn't even know that. There's no, there's no website. We've never said anything about it. But I asked the people doing it, and they said, well, you know, it's not going to be that. But no, I mean, it's, you know, obviously not. But it's, it's, you know, it's, I think people who do catalyst development 
This is actually the point I was making just to come back to Jonathan's point, is, and this is the point I wanted to make is when you don't know that something is doable, you don't spend a lot of money trying to do it. Once you know it's doable, then you spend a lot of money doing it. And my point is that if we can show a path to $50 barrel oil, then it's not a question of you keep innovating. They can spend a thousand times more than you. I'm not talking about China, I'm talking about US large oil companies and patents be damned, everything be damned, it's not gonna matter. If we're willing to go to war over this stuff, they're not gonna respect patents. So I don't agree, frankly, that this is just like we can innovate in Silicon Valley. This is a field in which you know, synthetic biology is becoming like open source and nature has given us 5,000 parts for every part that we're marveling because we have a patent on it. You just do a Google search and you'll get 500 other things that do the same thing. So what I worry about is what's the existence proof. Once we do an existence proof and we break our you know, bank accounts doing it, that's all I just want people to be thinking about it because if you wait till that point, God forbid you succeed, then it's too late to do anything about it. Now, we can disagree, which is fine, but I, well, I, it's, I know, but these are MIT people, so they're thinking, they're thinking well into the future, I hope. Uh, and my other question was, I was hoping to actually hear from all four of you guys, is if you, were, if you guys were 22 and sitting in this chair, <laughs> what, would, what type of company would you try to, what type of technology would you try to develop, you know, what type of innovations would you pursue? pursue a very focused approach to making cheap sugars. A better snowboard. <laughs> I, I would love to be 22 and sitting in that chair. This is another way of saying how to remain 22 for a long time. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? I have a question about the uh, the overall economics of, uh, of products that you're making. I think we've had lots of good discussion here around uh, maintaining margins and, and the possibility of getting squeezed, I think John mentioned earlier on. Um, so basically, the, the, two, the kind of challenges that everyone sees in, in a commodity markets. So I'm interested in, in John and Jonathan and Bob in particular, what are you investing in at your companies to try to protect yourself against those margin squeezes? Is it trying to uh, get, are you, are you pursuing feedstock diversification? Are you, pursuing, are you pursuing process improvements to get yields up? Are you pr in pursuing um, better ways of building plants to reduce capital intensity? What, what kinds of things are keeping you up at night that you're, that you're investing in to try to reduce those kind of risks? Yeah. <laughs> it's a set of well, yes, 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 and yes. Uh, and then I think your last question is, so kind of keeping you up at night, so which one to focus on, right? And I'd say, uh, first of all, avoid commodity markets. Uh, and, I, and I think I said it earlier during my uh, presentation, which is commodity markets are fine. You need a huge balance sheet to be able to withstand the, the, the overall pressure and to build enough volume to be meaningful in a commodity market. Uh, and uh, I think having a partner with a large balance sheet is a critical element of being sustainable in a commodity market. Now, you may become the company with a large balance sheet at some point, but that's not where we are today. So I think that's the first strategy is avoid the commodity market. And secondly, focus on products and markets that have a high average selling price. Why? Because we're gonna get it wrong. And the best way to ensure sustainability is have a high enough price that provides you enough of a margin that you can be off. And then the last one is actually focused on the technology, which is from a technical perspective, both uh, from an engineering perspective, from a process condition perspective, and from a core science perspective, uh, the, the, the strain and the productivity and performance of the overall strain, how do you work all three to optimize and constantly work down cost? And that is a constant or a work in progress. It is constantly working to get it down. You use the ASP to provide you cover, average selling price to provide you cover as you're constantly working the, the, the price down. So I'm sorry I didn't answer your commodity question directly, but if I, again, if I were to tell you it's uh, avoid it or said differently, don't 
go into a business where that is your only opportunity is to survive or win in the commodity business. I don't know of any commodity business who actually depends on the commodity as its survival. I mean, if you look at refineries, refineries have significant cuts of crude. Why do they do that? Because they want a wide range of exposure to markets so they're not exposed to a single commodity in the process. So why would we be any different? I think a lot of the markets that we're focused on are not markets where you're going to see a lot of price reaction. And what I mean by that is the pricing of a lot of the markets we're into are driven by their cost inputs. And the cost inputs on the petrochemical side, other than the drop in natural gas, is, tends to be up. And then depending on where you are, natural gas may or may not be your friend. But at the end of the day, I don't think most of the markets we're dealing with, we're going to see uh, those markets have the ability and, and or the inclination to want to react to it. And in, me in many cases, we would be a feedstock to some of what they're doing. So they will react to whatever the lowest cost feedstocks are to convert into whatever gives them the best return on their, their invested capital. I guess I'd answer your question with a, with, with, a, with a half answer, which is, and it really depends on the way that you define commodity markets, but, but I'll say something I said at the beginning, which is, in order to be involved in a commodity market, you need to be around long enough to get there. And that's either uh, by partnering with somebody with the right balance sheet or getting yourself to the point where you have the right balance sheet. And so the way, the way I would kind of define uh, the, the strategies uh, that, that are going to enable you to get there, it's all the things that were mentioned, but it's also things like understanding the application side and understanding what the customers really want and figuring out how to provide things that uh, th that are important. Uh, maybe early on they're going to be very special and important. As as over time they're going to become commoditized, and 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 you use that leverage to work your way into the markets. We we um, we announced uh, a couple weeks ago a, a, a an offtake agreement and, a, and an exp expanded joint development agreement with Dow for dielectric uh, uh, transformer fluids, and that's a a big market, whether you'd call it a commodity market or not, I'm not sure. The incumbent is mostly uh, is is mostly mineral oil from petroleum, but we we also announced that um, uh, part of the pricing uh, for that agreement is based on uh, uh, is based on uh, input sugar costs. So I mean, these are the kinds of things you do to make sure that you can kind of maintain that margin no matter what happens. Um, it's not a full commodity answer, but remember, you got to be there to get to those markets. Uh, Biofuels Digest had a story about this meeting yesterday, and uh, I think the a point of that was the question of contamination uh, with the panel, and uh, in terms of the cost of the fermentation equipment that you need to have to prevent contamination in your processes. Uh, would the panel like to respond to that? article that was, but I would say, again, coming back to the issue of execution, the companies that have been successful in industrial biotech have gone down the experience and learning curve. Each of us want to get down that curve and build our IP. The best IP, we start with pretty good IP, but the best IP is yet to come as you expand and implement these things. So I'm, I'm not sure specifically of the issue, but it is, this is really about execution. One last question. Yes, uh, currently octane ratings give aviation fuel and automotive fuel uh, the ability of a consumer to differentiate in the performance. Uh, it's a quantitative measure that is universal. Uh, coming back to an earlier question on sort of the carbon life cycle impacts of biofuels, uh, would the GREET standard or some other industry-wide standard on uh, carbon life cycle analysis give at least the uh, voluntary market, some quantitative measure. The, the one thing I'll say, which is pro we, we like the fact that greed exists. The, the, the problem is that there's a bit of dark art to it. If you take two extremely experienced uh, life cycle analysis people and you give them the same GREET model and the same inputs and you put them back to back, you're likely to get two different outputs, unfortunately. 
and uh, and and that's part of the problem um, not the fact that that the, the LCA is actually really critical. It's an important question. It's part of the value proposition that biofuels take to the table. The, the challenge is it's the measurement tools are really quite unpredictable right now. And that uncertainty is, is the same kind of uncertainty uh, that you see with you know, subsidies and things like that. If you don't understand how carbon is going to be measured um, and you're building a plant somewhere that's based on a particular feedstock and you're investing $100 million in, a, in, in that plant and you think right now that that model is rigged a certain way that you're going to meet the uh, LCFS or, or, uh, or, or you're going to get RIN credits from RFS2 and then it turns out that the, 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 the you know, Cal EPA, CARB, or, uh, or, or, or the US EPA changes the model all of a sudden, you know, I mean, that uncertainty is probably the biggest problem. Having really long-term, well-defined life cycle analysis tools that are standardized is going to be very important um, in, in a very positive way, but that's just not where we are right now. Well, I, I think that brings us to the end of the uh, panel discussion. I want to thank the panelists for a great uh, job.